Hi everyone, it's Greg Hurrell here, and today I want to talk about fuzzy finders. Um, I'm specifically going to talk about uh, one that I wrote a long time ago now, called uh, Command T, uh, because I recently rewrote the internals of it, and I think there's some interesting topics to discuss um, just around Vim plugin architecture in general. Um, so that's what I want to talk about. I haven't really thought a lot about what I'm going to say, so forgive me if this is a little bit random and rambly, and also forgive me that in the background I've got like a bunch of laundry hanging out to dry because uh, I haven't had a lot of uh, spare time. So with that prelude out the way, uh, let's get started. So what's a fuzzy finder? Um, you've seen me use them a lot in these screencasts, even though I tend not to talk explicitly about the fact that I'm using Command T or, or how it works. Uh, but basically the idea is you, know, you hit a binding and then you type some letters from the path for the thing you're looking for. So for example, in this project, which is Command T itself, just say I want to go to the score.c file. Um, I could type a couple of letters from that and it filters the list and you know I can I can navigate up and down but when I've got the one that I want I hit my key and I can I can jump to it um, and so I uh, just say I want to look at the benchmark I'm going to go to benchmark file here like say that one there I can open this in a split by hitting a different binding I might want to go check the readme um, I could open that in a horizontal split I might want to go to um, I don't know the test script um, and open that in a tab so we've got, we've got bindings for basically finding things and opening them in different ways um, we've also got different kinds of finders. So for example, I've got a buffer finder here that corresponds to all the buffers that I just opened. Um, and if it's already open, it will basically load the file for me. Um, so an example of that would be on the left where I have score C. And if I get my buffer finder open again, and I, I type some letters from score C and I open it, it doesn't actually reopen um, the file all over again. What it does is just jump to the buffer where it already is. Um, so I use this a lot um, and it's a, one of the key ways for me to get around. Now, um, for some context, there's a reason why I haven't talked about Command T on this screencast in any kind of overt way, and that is because it is hard to install. Um, and, you know, I wrote this something like 13 years ago um, and never really promoted it, even though I could have, because in some ways it was, it was very good, um, because it was and still is the fastest fuzzy finder out there. Um, but... Uh, it is hard to install and so if I were to promote it and talk about it a lot then all I would actually wind up with is a, um, a set of support tickets saying like oh, it didn't install for me or it doesn't build and you know all that kind of stuff um, and so I thought no this is this is a tool for me and I want the project to be fun so I'll put it up there on GitHub if people want to use it they can um, but I'm not going to actually actively promote it and th th the same is still true today <laughs> really um, and so but I'm breaking the rule of, t of not talking about command T because I am pretty excited about some of the work I've done recently to make it even faster um, and what I did, basically, I took the old code, which was, um, it was written in C uh, and wrapped in a Ruby plugin. And I've rewritten it in Lua uh, and I've targeted it at, um, at NeoVim. So I'm using new APIs and I'm using a faster kind of like wrapper language to implement the plugin itself. Um, and then the fast bits in the core are still in C. Uh, but one nice thing is that when I brought it over from being a Ruby extension that had a native C component, when I brought it over to being something that I could call from Lua, I rewrote the, the, the C parts in a pure form. So they, they don't have any knowledge of Ruby or Lua, it's just a pure like C library that only calls standard library functions. Um, and so could be used in other contexts fairly easily um, if, if you wanted to call into these methods. Um, and I found that even though I've spent like a decade making command T as fast as possible, um, this new version is about twice as fast, which is pretty exciting to me um, because you know, basically speed is like the only reason this project exists. Because um, you could look at other, other projects, like a long time ago, there's one called Control P, which um, stopped being maintained um, and had like so many more features than, than Command T. Um, and a lot of people preferred to use that even though it was slower. Um, and now in modern times, you've got uh, obviously F FZF came out. Um, a lot of people like that. That's pretty fast too because it's. I think it's written in Go, um, although it's not as fast as this. Um, but that's been very popular. And of course, lately, Telescope has like a huge feature set and is very extensible and seems to be the, the favorite of everybody now. Um, but I'm going to keep using Command T because I have very large repos that I work in. And for me, it's really important that it be fast. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about um, what I think is interesting about the plugin architecture here. Um, and I guess what I want to talk about is the fact that most people, when they install Vim plugins, they use a package manager. 
and their package manager is going to pull down like the head of the master branch or the head of the main branch or whatever the default branch in the project is called and then periodically they will update their their plugin install um, and the problem with that is is that it basically robs the developer of the possibility of like communicating about releases to users because you know they can publish change logs and release notes and they can use semantic versioning semver to say oh here's a breaking change don't update unless you're aware of this breaking change and think it's worth it. All that kind of just goes out the window because if everybody's tracking head of master or head of main uh, and blindly updating, then their stuff is going to break every time you do a breaking change. So my challenge here in basically rewriting the whole thing from being a Vim Ruby plugin to being a NeoVim Lua plugin was I had to figure out a way to do that without breaking stuff for everybody. And I hope that I've done it. Uh, but uh, time will tell whether or not I've actually done it. So what, what, what have I actually done? Well, what I've actually done is I've left the old code in there exactly where it was. And when you first open command T after pulling master or main, um, you'll see a, a prompt down the bottom asking you to choose whether you want to switch to the Lua version or keep using the, the Ruby version. If you want to keep using the Ruby version, um, you can keep using it forever because I'm unlikely to change the code in the Ruby branch or in the Ruby directory um, in any kind of significant way. Um, so that's that's all still there, like exactly exactly as it has been. Um, well, it, it's not been frozen for the last 10 years, but it has existed for 10 years. And um, after the first few years, like the basic shape of it had already kind of settled. Um, so that's going to basically stay there forever. Um, and all the new stuff is in Lua land in this Lua directory. Um, and so I'm actually pretty happy the way that worked because it means, for example, that you know, I can use this new version, um, which is this is the Lua version that we're looking at now. Um, and one of the things about uh, adopting new APIs is like I can draw floating windows now, so that makes the UI a little bit more responsive um, and more robust. Uh, but there are some features that I haven't yet implemented in the Lua version, and for those, I can just call the Ruby version because it's still there. Um, so for that binding that I just hit was uh, leader T. Um, to open, open command T um, and that corresponds to you know, running this command here, um, command T um, and there's a few variations of it like there's one that uses like a git finder um, there's one that uses well you can see a number there like there's a rip grep etc so these are all implemented um, using the new version but let's pick one that isn't um, implemented in Lua yet um, we could for example look at uh, I'm not actually all that good at remembering which ones are implemented in the Ruby one, but not the... Okay, I think I've got one. So let's look at this file here. Um, I think I've got one called something like command T line. Yeah, so this is going to show me lines in the buffer. There they are. Um, and then I can type something like some words from them and, and then it will jump to the line with that word in it. Um, so that was command T line. Um, and you'll notice that the UI didn't look anything like the new one. And that's because it's the old UI. Um, the old UI was written to work with um, just Vim. Um, eventually, when NeoVim came along, it kept working with NeoVim. But you know, think back to 2009 or so when Vim was like at Vim, Vim version 7, and uh, there was no such thing as floating windows, and there were really basically you know no features at all beyond you know that core set that had been in there for a long time. So to do a UI like this, um, you basically have to use you have to use like pretend mechanisms for like showing UI in, inside the editor. So what this is is actually you know, a buffer um, with lines in it. And down the bottom where the prompt is, um, that's that's basically mappings that are intercepting the key pressing, the key presses. So like when I want to hit G there, that was a mapping of G to a, to a function call that updated the state of the match listing and updated the lines in the buffer. Um, and when I get out of this buffer and hit escape, uh, the buffer is destroyed. But you can imagine if you have a situation where you have splits that, uh, and then I open that again, like this buffer has to be very careful to remember the way the splits were before it was opened so that when I close it, just I want to go to this line here, threads on line 90, it keeps the basic layout of the windows the way they were. Now that's a total pain in the ass, right? Like nobody wants to write code like that. I um, mean, if you look at the old code for command, uh, command T, like most of it was around, you know, managing splits and state and like saving and restoring settings and uh, it was a bit of a pain. Um, the other thing that was a bit of a pain, I think, um, because I'd come from the Objective-C world, you know, Apple's APIs and also Rails back then, um, I had a pretty strong MVC mindset and so I have a controller, I, you know, 
almost like a view layer and modelish layers. Um, that structure, you know, I'm not a, I'm not such a huge fan of object oriented styles anymore. I tend to prefer them in a very shallow way, like we want to encapsulate some data and some methods for operating on it. By all means, you know, stick it in a in a class. Um, but um, deep inher inheritance hierarchies tend to be more trouble than they're worth, and I have some of those in Command T. Like for example, we have these. Uh, I think uh, was it the scanners? So these are the, these are different ways of like getting potential paths that you might want to find. Um, for example, there's one there's one called the Watchman file scanner, which talks to the Watchman daemon, um, and that inherits from the find file scanner, as you can see here. Um, so basically, you know, if there's a problem with this scanner, um, it can basically call its parent and get its parent to do the work. If we look at the parent scanner, that's calling the find executable. Um, this scanner itself inherits from the file scanner, which is just, I think, a kind of abstract superclass, or maybe it uses something else. Yeah, I think it looks pretty abstract-ish. Um, so, you know, you've got these multiple layers of inheritance that are kind of unpleasant to use. Um, so, you know, in the Lua version, it's much more kind of like React-ish in design, where you have effectively, like, um, the UI determines what is going to be needed, and the UIs are these, you know, the, the prompt window there and the, the match listing window, and you know, when you need to update them, you just like pass in new data at the top and it kind of filters down the, the, the hierarchy and, and does everything it needs to do. Um, so the architecture is like much more pleasant to work with now. Um, I guess I have been rambling for a little bit now, so I'm going to wrap it up real soon. But there's one thing that I do want to show um, that is newish. Well, it's new. It's new. It's not newish. It's new in the, in the new design. Um, and that is um, we have some more, uh, some different scanner infrastructure now. Um, previously, you know, we had those scanners in Ruby that would do things like call external commands and then pass the strings into the C layer and let the C layer do the matching. Well, now we have scanners in the C layer directly. Um, and so, you know, things like that uh, rip grep scanner that I showed you already, or the git scanner, like what that's actually doing is in the C layer, uh, it's basically allocating a slab of memory and forking the process and just letting it write straight into the memory. Um, so there's no passing of strings between uh, what was the Ruby layer and then the internal layer. Um, so you know, Lua basically just says to the C layer, do this stuff. And the C layer does it really fast um, with a minimum of copying. Um, and then the only data that really has to get shoved back over the bridge to like Lua and therefore Vim is just this list of strings. Because I mean, there are more strings, obviously, than you can see here, but um, there's probably only like 20 or 22 or 23 or something there. Because there, there are that many that are visible, we only have to actually copy 23 strings. Um, you know, the, the higher layers aren't going to ask for more results than they can actually display. Um, and so that makes that way faster. Um, and so, I mean, I'm not going to go into the details, but you, if you were to look in here, you would see that, yeah, we basically allocate a slab, a slab of memory and then just stream results um, into, uh, into, the, um, into the, the, the slab of memory that we allocated. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it's faster. Because um, pretty much at every layer of the new design, I'm trying to avoid copying strings. Um, write them once and then do stuff with them. Um, and so one nice thing that this pattern allows is it's pretty extensible. So um, I think I've got, you know, I, I'm not sure I do, but uh, I, think, I think I've got somewhere. Yeah, I do. I've got an example here of how you could plug in another command to uh, create... Um, your own custom thing. So, so this example here basically creates a command t ack command. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna show that this works. At least I think it works because I think this command has ack. This, yeah, this machine does have ack on it. Um, so basically, you know, you can add to this list of finders. You can give it a name, um, and then you basically tell it what command it should run to populate the list. Um, so I'll eventually probably make this a little bit more extensible. But for now, this is a, a nice example of one of the things you can do um, to make this go. Um, and I guess um, the last thing I want to do is just to kind of validate or prove my claim that like this is the fastest thing out there. I mean, I don't have any like side by side benchmarks, but um, I can assure you if you um, if you install different fuzzy finders and try them next to one another, um, you will notice the difference. Um, but, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to my home directory, which is it's got a bunch of stuff in it. Um, or do I have actually? Where am I now? Uh, this is do I like Linux? Uh, Linux is a good one. That, that'll be a good one to look at. Um, so I'm going to just show you. Did I CD in here? Yeah, I, I got a, You've got to be in the directory for this to work. Um, so I just want to show you like how fast it is to you know scan a directory, for example, with ripgrep or even with Git, 
and then quickly find things. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to do that uh, root grep command again. Um, the old command T used to cache these these results because it was slow to scan them, but now scanning is so fast that you can just do it every time without caching. I'm, I mean, I may add the caching back later, but for now at least I don't need to. Um, now I don't know this project very well, so I'm not going to probably find stuff all that um, easily. But like just in terms of responsiveness, I just start typing words and basically it. You know, there's no perceptible delay between typing and the result appearing, which is wonderful because it makes you feel like the machine is directly plugged into your mind um, with no intermediate, inter intermediate layers, which I really like. Um, so come on, shout at me, give me, an, give me a string. What should I type? I don't know, because I, like I said, I don't know this project. Something, do we have something like, uh, I don't know, um, device pull, no, we don't, something. Thread pull, ethernet, I don't know. Whatever, like it's um, it's good. So um, I am pretty happy with it, but it is alpha. So I'm not actually telling you to run out and install it. Um, but if you're one of the kind of people who does have to work in huge repos, you might want to think about it. Um, I've got a feedback issue on the GitHub repo that I will put in the description so that if you do try it and find something weird about it, um, then uh, we can talk about it. Um, and I think I've got the docs in here. Um, so in the help, there are there's a list of like known issues, uh, except I haven't indexed the help, so I can't jump there. Known issues. Um, so there are some small known issues uh, that you should be aware of if you were to try this, uh, other than the fact that there's a lot of missing features. Um, we don't have any of that fallback implemented yet. So for example, if, uh, if you try to use Watchman, um, and, and there's a typo there, watch. Man? Yeah. Um, if you try to use Watchman and you haven't got it installed, or you know for some reason it doesn't work, um, it will complain. It won't gracefully fall back. Um, I think similar things like you could try to use the ripgrep scanner. If you don't have ripgrep installed, it'll just it'll just blow up. I haven't actually tested those failure modes yet. Um, as I, I said, we're not caching directory listings yet. I mean the documentation is woefully incomplete. <laughs> That's funny. Um, anyway, uh, thanks for watching, and uh, next time I'll get back to our regularly scheduled programming. All right, catch you later. Bye.